Good afternoon. Uh, this is for you. Uh, she holds PhD in Library and Information Sciences, and she's an expert in metadata data. And currently, she's RDA's ambas ambassador for interdisciplinary research. And in her Twitter profile, uh, well, actually, you say you are uh, open knowledge militant, which sounds, well, sounds good. Uh, so, first question, it's a very broad question, but uh, what is data? How do you define it? And what is the game? We, we will talk about data as a game changer, so what is the game and what is data? Well, that, that's a good question for this panel. <laughs> Everybody can answer that probably, and you will get as many answers as people are here. But if, it depends on what you, what you think about data. If you think about data in general, that would be something like the minimum uh, amount of something convertible in knowledge. That could be something like that. Um, but if you think about research data, for me, uh, data in the research kingdom is something that legitimizes your, it's an evidence of what you are doing as a research outcome. But um, also, that I always say that it's a question of prepositions. This in Spanish works very well, but in English also too, because it depends if you are thinking on data for research, on data from research, because the data for research that you are using today, if you apply the principle of reusability, there will be, again, data from research and all the way around. So I think everything can be data and everything can be used for, for research and for improvement knowledge. That this is a very broad concept. Probably we can get in a deeper definition, deeper approach, and depending on what we're doing. So George Strawn is currently the director of the board on research data and information at the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine. And there he focuses on open science and fair data. And prior to that, uh, Dr. Strong was the director of National Coordination Office for the network, Networking and Information Technology Research and Development Program. All the long names for the <laughs> programs, sorry. Uh, and Dr. Strong held this, uh, these positions while uh, on the leave from National Science Foundation to the Office of Science and Technology Policy in the White House. And, well, yes, and you have a PhD in mathematics. So we have, we have people from different fields. Uh, so, same question for you. What is data and what is the game we are talking about? Okay, I, I think of uh, data broadly as digital data, information, and knowledge all the things we're talking about that can be put in a computer that uh, change the game of how society is going to function. I like to think that we are just entering the third age of computing. And I'm not talking about vacuum tubes to transistors to chips. I'm talking about the first age where we had many computers and many data sets. And the second age, which started about 1995, where we have many data sets, but only one computer. Old people may remember Sun Computer's uh, marketing slogan, the network is the computer. We have one computer and the network is the backplane. We, you all, are in the process of bringing in the third age of computing, where we will have one computer and one data set, namely the interoperability of heterogeneous data. That's the important thing. So, and Pilvi, uh, Pilvi Torsti, well, she's a very old friend of mine, so I don't have to, well, I, I don't have to, well, she don't have to introduce herself to me, but I have to introduce her to you. Uh, she's the State Secretary at the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Employment, and prior to that, she was a member of the Parliament here in Finland, and she's been member of Helsinki City Council since 2012 
And before that, she was, well, working for Helsinki University, where she has a PhD in history. And, well, I think between all those works, she started a startup uh, for uh, educational, well, ed educational startup. So she's been doing a lot of things. So you have multiple roles. You are a politician and you are a history scholar. So for you, what is data? Yeah, hello everyone. As, as a representative of a government, one should, I'm very happy that uh, I was introduced with two hats. So the other one is being a, a adjunct professor of, of political history. So now I can also freely talk about the fields that are not exactly of my ministries only. And no one can get offended because they can say we, I talk about th those uh, with the scientific, uh, scientific hat on. Um, for a historian, uh, data has, of course, always had a very special meaning. Uh, historians used to think, used to see themselves as those first, in a way, doing the first data proof exercise, actually, in a way, analyzing what is data that should be taken into research and that we can use to make sense of the past for us to understand the present and then have expectations for the future. I myself have been studying something called historical consciousness, which we have defined always that there is an interlinkage between the present, the past, and the future, and that somehow defines both societies and individual thinking. However, currently, I would very much define data, as George did, connected to the digital age, digitalization, so that it is something that is constantly being created, uh, constructed, uh, collected, in various processes that we are all part in. And now it's a very big question for all of us, a major question, and I understand that's why you are here for, how do we sort of, what ethical approaches we take, what uh, sort of societal approaches, legislative approaches we actually take. But that would be my definition. So let's say I've changed from historian and perhaps into policymaker, and my, my definition for data has changed over time too. And Alexander Turnroot leads Finland's AI Accelerator, uh, one of the key actions of the national AI uh, strategy, Teko Äly Aika. Try to say that, Teko Äly Aika. Uh, the accelerator is established by Technology Industries of Finland and funded by the Ministry of Employment and Economic Affairs. So you might know each other from there. Uh, and I checked your Twitter profile, and it said you are an entrepreneur, investor, and craft beer fan. I would like to go to the craft beer part of this, but maybe we do it after the discuss panel discussion. So for you, what is data? Yeah. I own a brewery, that's why I'm a craft beer fan. But I'm not going to go into that. Uh, I think, to honestly, we stress a bit too much about data today. Maybe this is not the right forum to say that out loud, but I, I think I just did. Uh, for me, data is practically just a piece of information that is recorded in a more efficient way than, well, our brain could. And without kind of the use, the ability to use data, it's not, it's basically nothing, it's just dust. And if you want to get dust into being some kind of magical dust, then I think we need data science to give us insights insights and information and above or to add on data science, of course, machine learning, uh, giving us recommendations and then AI giving actually actions. If we don't do that, data is basically nothing. Uh, well, well, actually, I asked, first I asked a question with two questions about the game and what is changing. So let's go back to that. What, what do you see? What, what is the big picture? Why are we here? What is, the, what is the game that is changing when we talk about data? Well, I, I agree upon what they have said before that what really is a game changer in the society is technology because we can uh, access so many data before the technology. You cannot bear with so many data. Make uh, 
the data is like when you are a, um, an engineer of design, you have one plastic glass and you can do nothing. If you have millions of plastic bags, you can make a building. It's the same thing. It's a question of quantity. It's not a question of uh, the, the size. It's not big data. It's massive data. Um, the game changer is technology. It's not the data itself. It's the way that we produce in a very efficient and in a very amount, uh, big amount of, uh, of data. I think this is really what changed the whole thing and why I have this and I don't have a notebook and everybody has a device or three or more, you know. Wow, you, you are a weird person, I'm sorry. Yeah. George, please. So, um, to come up to the uh, application layer, I think what we are doing is doing our best to enable open science. Open science began with original definition when the Royal Academy in uh, England suggested publishing articles rather than keeping your results proprietary in the 16th century. And that slowly came, came up, and by the 19th and 20th century, we were publishing too many articles, but that's, that's another story. In any event, modern open science is going to mean publishing all science outputs, not only articles, but data and software and workflow and any other artifacts that are developed during a scientific project. Well, publishing data as a raw file would be meaningless, right? And it's, it's meaningless unless you have the appropriate metadata mm -hmm. and description. Uh, the, the, the phrase that has caught the world's attention right now is fair data, which uh, I subscribe to, findable, interop uh, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Interoperable is the most difficult, as I mentioned earlier. How do you promote the interoperability of heterogeneous data? Once we can do that, and this is not a short-term project, but once we can do that, interdisciplinary research will be greatly uh, accelerated and, and convenienced. Uh, even within disciplines, uh, it's going to be useful when colleagues can share their data easily. Now, everyone says to share data outside your own area takes about 80% of your time to get the data ready to analyze. I think our goal should be to cut that 80% of manual time to 20%, thereby we will quadruple the amount of time available for analyzing the data. Yeah, first perhaps I should note that I, I, I think I was one of the first users of pocket pieces at the time when they came, but I've moved back to a sort of world where I both use technology and analogical uh, uh, technology, and I use the same system in my notes, both in my written notebook and in my iPad. So I think we are interesting uh, uh, sort of spe spe species as humans, how we actually uh, adapt uh, to our technologies. But the question, I was thinking of it last night when we got it, that what is actually the game that has changed as, that was put to us? And I'm, perhaps my answer is a very common sense one for you, but I think the definition still should be clear even when we talk among professionals. And I think there are about perhaps four at least that I could think that are the fundamentals that we just should recognize. First one is that we simply have more sensors all around us, so we are creating uh, much more uh, data than we did uh, uh, before. The second level is that we have, we have a, a storage capacity, uh, again, for all that that we are collecting. Th thirdly, we have uh, more and more sufficient uh, ways, and I think George was talking about, the sufficient ways to collect, uh, to connect different data sets that we have collected and stored. And finally, we have more and more analytical tools, uh, artificial intelligence, etc., to analyze all that we have first uh, collected, stored, and then connected together. So all that is changing the game in terms of the sort of magnitude and scale at the moment. Yeah, Alexander. Yeah, I think because I, of course, look at the matter from a company perspective. So I think we have, uh, of course, the first one is the game changing, or the game that is changing, of course, is the, the team structure. Uh, previously, when we had, had maybe hadn't that much of data, we could have one person to basically be the owner of the data, so to say, in the company. And nowadays, when we have a lot of data and 
coming uh, from different kind of sources and we will need to have of course bigger team with kind of different uh, different uh, capabilities and abilities the second that i see kind of big change maybe coming is of course uh, just the company's knowledge how to work with data and it's actually more more comes to the basic stuff the everyday stuff and for example i in the startups I established or the boards that I sit, I, when you have a board meeting, usually we're quite used to go through the numbers, numbers and, and look, make forecasts, how are the sales, but how many boards can actually say that they actively talk about their data? I would say there's not a lot of companies doing that. So what kind of data do we have? What are we doing to actually have better data? and kind of use this as strategic assets. I think this is the game that will change. I'll go back to George. George, uh, you talk about the uh, open data, open science, science and fair, fair data, data. But is that kind of utopia? Because actually, actually is, 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 is the scientific world actually the one who is benefiting for the open, well, actually not open data, but all the data we are collecting, so much data, as Pilvi said. So, who is winning? Who is benefiting for the game change, changing game? It is an open, uh, a ut utopic view. Uh, in 1990, it was a utopic view to think about most of the world being connected to the internet. So, I think this is another uh, view of utopia that is going to come to pass because it will be of so much benefit to society broadly. Will it be easy? No. I like to say openness is very good for science and bad for scientists because it will take their time away from their already two full schedules. Uh, once we get over that hump, and I'm talking a decade or two, not a year or two, this is a, this is a, a serious long-term project, as the Internet was. You know, today, you know, this year is the 50th birthday of the Internet. The Internet rolled out first three nodes in 1969. So don't expect open science to dominate uh, in the next year. Don't, like I say, uh, the Royal Academy made this proposal in 1679 or something like that, and it really was the 1900s before things were, uh, 1800s before things were rolling along with a lot of publications. So it's gonna come. There is more cultural resistance then there is technology resistance. The technologies are almost ready. The hardware technology is there. That's why we can talk about this software layer. We couldn't do that a decade before because uh, you know, we've, we've gone from a gigabyte of storage costing about a million dollars to a gigabyte of storage costing about two cents. Because of that economic change, we can talk about storing all the information in the world from the Internet of Things and, and wherever else we, we tend to bring it, but now we can store more data than we can effectively analyze. So the next step is how do we effectively analyze all this data that we can store? Eva. No, I, I completely agree, and actually I, I think you have said what I was thinking, that uh, we cannot have this discussion with the scientists. Would you like to be an open scientist or would you like to be tenure? This is not the question. We have to promote that if you want to be an open scientist, you have to be a, a real excellent and open because openness is a clear uh, motivator of quality, in my opinion. I always put example that if, uh, if, I, if I'm recorded my classes, they have to be perfect. Not because of my students, if it is a MOOC, because my colleagues are, are looking at me too. So that's the, the difference when you, you teach you know, in an open environment, when you share your data in an open environment, or when you share your data in your farm of colleagues. So I think it's a clear invitation for be, being a very good scientist. Uh, to, and, and it's going to happen. I completely agree with you that it's going to happen. And I hope that now that the changes are more, uh, you have, we can speed up with technology more the changes. We don't need to spend 30 uh, years on developing the web. I think developing the web of data will take us less. Hope so. Um, of course, open data and open science also mean different things here. And uh, in the Finnish context, the open science issue 
has been very, very broadly discussed recently because having, as we have a public uh, higher education system, so we are quite used to the fact that in a way the commercial interest is not so much in our publications as it's in some, many other countries. And therefore the whole issue that suddenly you wouldn't get your, that you publish something and it's not openly available because of a publisher somewhere, uh, it's a very, it, it became as a new notion to many of us. And I think it also, I mean, for, just take, to take a personal example, I defended my PhD thesis in 1998. And that was uh, uh, published both as a book and as an e-thesis by the university. Open, I mean, no one thought it was something unusual. It was an open science, but we didn't call it that way, I believe. And I recall also that in the bo book itself, I included a CD-ROM with my data. So in other words, I also had open data. And being a historian, that was, of course, relatively unusual. So I got feedback from one of the deans of the Faculty of Social Sciences saying, this is the very first time ever I received data set from a social scientist as part of the book publication. And this all sounds now quite unscient, doesn't it? <laughs> Archival, right? <laughs> Almost. But that was actually open data and open science. Congratulations. <laughs> so, um, yesterday, researcher Tuli Toivonen talking about this issue, that there's more and more data, but, but she was, and, and she said that, that science is really benefiting, but she said uh, she's afraid that sooner or later all the data will be commercialized. And she talked about uh, data, data oligarchy. What do you think about that? Are you afraid of data being commercialized and, and uh, well, that there will be some kind of monopoly or olig oligopoly for? I'll give you a great answer, yes and no. <laughs> I, am, uh, I, I would be afraid if the commercialized data means we turn over our copyright to the commercial entities the way we have done with publications for the last few years. We need to maintain ownership of our own data, and I'd like to get it back for our articles too, if you want to know the truth. If we could manage that issue, then I welcome the uh, commercial sector in with open arms. I look at the uh, development of the internet, which was a US government project for 30 years, and uh, then when the internet exploded, at least in the US, there's no way the government could have supported that uh, huge activity. The commercial sector came in and made it a nationwide and then a worldwide utility. Uh, we couldn't have done that. At that point, it was absolutely time to turn over the business to the private sector. Same thing applies here, but please, as a service provider, not as a data owner. Yeah. Sure. I, I completely agree. I think it's not a, something, it's completely natural that you make uh, money out of something that is open. For example, think about the lawyers. They can make money with the law in the hand because they can't add it value to the law. And it's fantastic, it's a profession. So here, there are many professionals that they can make money with the data. It's absolutely fair. But the point is that which kind of uh, data we're going to, to expose to the commercial issues, uh, which kind of data that they are, um, research data have privacy issues, or they have this kind of, you know, because could could happen that that not all the data could be part of the commercial uh, kingdom, right? But but it's completely legal and completely fine that we reinvent uh, a new profession with something consuming something open, and I think it's a big game change. Yeah, I think um, honestly that of course some player can add up more data than others. It's obvious. Uh, but the kind of bigger question is, for me, actually the sharing of data. So, as, as was pointed out earlier, uh, we have the hardware and everything, but basically we don't have the culture of doing that. So I guess like, if we would come into a situation where somebody who would have a, uh, too much power or too much of the data, I think that would kind of be well done through legislation or whatever, but still 
nowadays when I look at it, it's more a question of data sharing than anything else. To get data sharing intact, that's what we need to do. Yeah, perhaps I would also, rather than focusing on the threat, which I think is over-focused in most of the discussions, and I, it sounds like that was in the focus. I'm not trying to criticize this today's discussion, but simply for the sake of conversation, to take two points which are not threats. First one, following from Alexander, uh, sharing and then also quality of data. I was actually today just coincident, coincidentally visiting the Finnish Institute for Health and Welfare. That's a very long-standing uh, institution in Finland, uh, having um, a huge amount of registries of our uh, health uh, data. Uh, currently, for instance, published data of a school survey that practically included all school children of Finland, and so on and so on. And they also, of course, have partner institutions that are publicly funded that both collect data and also have registries. And I was asking, because I was knowing, I knew I was coming here, that how do they see actually this at the moment in terms of research, in terms of commercial use and so on. And they said that the biggest issue for them by far is the quality. Starting with the doctor that goes to see me or Alexander, that whether it's a standardized data that is being created from that one visit, and coming up to how that it's being then treated from the privacy point of view, and whether, for instance, I as a patient have a right immediately, not only to say how my data cannot be used, but also to say how it could be used, because we are focusing all the time now this, how we actually are preventing our data being used, for instance, for the health, uh, uh, health research. The other issue I would like to take, so, this, so I see there is more issues on the quality and data sharing as Alexander. And then the second one, I liked in the very opening speech of Alexander this concept of data as dust, and that it only becomes a sort of wonder dust through a, uh, a process. Very, very often as a politician, I'm asked sort of, you know, is data the new oil? Because, of course, you know, Finland is a bit envious to Norway uh, for the oil, so then we think that if our data registers are very good, so could we sort of benefit from them. And, well, I don't, I'm not sure if I like this, this oil uh, um, metaphor. The, the best metaphor I have come up, and I'm very open to criticism to this, is that data could be perhaps thought as water. Water can be totally uh, non-valuable if it's in the wrong place at the wrong time and not used, but it can be extremely valuable, uh, life-saving uh, at the right place at the right time for the right uh, use. So uh, I, I think you're thinking about the wonder data, uh, wonder dust was in a very same same thinking actually that I had here. So we should always uh, define a little bit before we start seeing threats or opportunities, that uh, it's not by itself unsich, as they say in German, that data has, for instance, value or a threatening value. Would you like to comment on this? I, 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 I totally agree. I like the water metaphor. I may start using that myself. Can I do it without, with attribution? It's, I've discussed it last night with my husband, who is a lawyer, so I let him know. All right, good, good, good. I'll... <laughs> oh, no, co no copyright that. That's that's open open for use. <laughs> um, well, well, this conversation goes uh, here and there, but but I go back and actually it, it is uh, actually the same same question about the data ownership, as George mentioned. Uh, it's an issue. Who should own the data? Is the, is it valuable for for me uh, if I have this my little well of water there? Or who should own it? Anyone? Well, you know my opinion already. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I'm <clears throat> going to ask or counter ask you can you own data? Sure. You can own data. Well, and if we go back to the, that's why oil is also a bad example because data is. Nothing compared to oil. Oil is an asset that you can physically own. I can use it if I use it, you can't. But data is the complete opposite of that. We can use it all together on the same time. So in my point of view, the data ownership question is maybe 
important in the kind of US privacy discussions, otherwise not that important. Actually, we should again focus more on the how do we use the data than who owns it. That's become, when we agree on how we use it, then the ownership question depleted. I guess I could add a little. Many of you probably have read Jared Lanier's book a few years ago, Who Owns the Future? That uh, again makes the, the, the case that we ought to be uh, finding some way to own our own data. Uh, the example he gives is, uh, well, you may think you're a customer when in fact you're part of the product. When you give your information to Google or to Amazon or so on and so forth, that's very valuable information in aggregation with the other customers and that will be sold as appropriately, both internally and externally, uh, to help evaluate uh, people's preferences and who's searching for what and so forth. Um, two different um, points. The first one, um, as a historian, I like also sometimes to think that think about your own time as the past of some future time. And I believe some future time, thinking this time as it's past, will wonder that how was it possible that the humans let their such an amount of their data being owned mainly by US companies without almost noticing it. That will appear almost impossible to believe in the future that looks this time as it's past. The second point is, um, as a policymaker and representative of the government, there are of we of course should always focus, one thing that we should focus our work on is to protection of, of the weaker groups of the society, for instance, minors, children and young people. And here I see the question of the personal data ownership extremely significant at the moment. In Finland, we've had quite strong My Data movement, which I really have welcomed and find very interesting. And in particular, the My Data movement at the moment, I hope, is able to produce results for children and young people. I'm a mother of children aged from 5 to 15, and, and I really would like to be able somehow to guarantee to my children that they, once they are 18, are sort of, you know, free of any predestined data uh, ownership. And currently it's quite difficult. So, and I understand some countries are working on this and there are interesting developments. I don't know enough to say much about it, but I think this is a very important uh, issue here. Yeah. I will add just something uh, that uh, thinking about two concepts of ownership. One is property. Uh, this self is thin, that this is my house, this is my data. And the other one is uh, ownership as a question of credit, which is something like the researchers, we want to get credit for what we produce. But the point of the, the comes again to the open science and open data approach, actually now in the European legislation, it was approved the public sector information uh, the um, European Directive in June, at the end of June, 26th of June, and includes research data as a matter of uh, commons, you know, as a good of the society, because the society pays for those data if it is funded research. And, and I think it's, it's kind of a way of sharing more than ownership. And think about this metaphor again. Uh, if I have an apple and I give you the apple, I cannot eat my apple. But if I have my data and I show you my data, I don't lose them. I can't even do my research and perhaps we do something together. So the concept of ownership, in my opinion, is something like it's uh, against the evolution of science, the, the property, the concept of property and the ownership. Yeah, Alexander. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And uh, <clears throat> I see it quite clearly also in our day-to-day -day activities Finance AI actually help established firms develop and deploy AI. And of course, we work in a group of companies, so actually the data questions arise every time we form a new group around one specific technology. And for example, the ownership questions comes very strongly from, we've been talking about lawyers here, so from their point of view, because usually it's somewhere between IPR clauses and, or, and 
NDA clauses. So, for example, I'm very glad now that the technology industry of Finland established a model clause for data sharing. And I think if we can adopt these, these model clauses on a, on a broader level, will actually help a lot of in the ownership question and, of course, the data sharing. If I may, I'd sure. like to uh, raise the horizon to a 200-year answer to the question, is data going to be important? This will be a 50-minute lecture in the next three minutes, so please pay attention closely. Two books I would like to reference, uh, The New Renaissance by Robertson and The Printing Press as an Agent of Change by Eisenstein. Librarians in the crowd may very well have read that. Uh, Robertson points out that there were, you know, we divided computing into three, three periods. You, many people divide humanity into three periods, whether it's hunter-gatherer and then agriculture and then industry, or stone tools and then bronze tools and then uh, steel tool, iron, iron tools. I'll, uh, Robertson divides it into four groups uh, based on information rather than artifacts, other artifacts. Spoken language, which made us human. Written language, which gave us history and prehistoric so that's only a 5,000-year thing. Printed language for the last 500 years, and now computed language, computed data, what we're talking about here today. My point is going to be, I'm going to now tell you what Eisenstein said were the results of printed language 500 years ago, and the claim that she makes, both of them make, and I make as well, is that the changes to our society will be at least as profound going forward as the changes wrought by the printing press 500 years ago. What did the printing press do? Here's five things. Number one, it enabled the scientific revolution. How could we publish the articles if they had to be published in manuscript form? It would never become the public entity that it is. Number two, the world had tried to have a renaissance beforehand of a re re rebirth of interest in Greek and uh, Roman language. It took the printing press to make that a reality. So a sustainable uh, re renaissance was required by the printing press. Number three, the Protestant rev revolution could not have occurred without the printing press and Gutenberg making Bibles that people could read in their own language and so forth. Number four, it's been argued, and, and I agree, that the nation state itself probably could not have been uh, established without broadly circulated literature. I mean, our, our loyalties before that were to the, uh, the county, let's say, rather than to this new, rather new entity called the nation state, which only emerged a few hundred years ago. Finally, given all these things, perhaps the very concept of the individual itself, with its own point of view by reading its own literature and so forth, is a function of the printing press. Those are pretty five, five pretty big things, right? Are we creating something that's going to be at least as big? Well, I've already said that I think the new scientific revolution, where pub we publish all our outputs rather than just our articles, is going to be a scientific revolution, which I think will be as important as the original scientific revolution. We will be developing new science in ways that we don't understand right now. Number two, I don't know if there's a new renaissance to be had, so I don't see a comparison there. Number three, well, I think we have something equivalent to the Protestant Revolution right now. It goes by names like fake news. Mm -hmm. right? So we have entirely new means of communication at the moment looking more like a negative than a positive, but that's what's going on. Next to the last, of course, is uh, the nation state. Well, we already see the nation state have giving up some of its sovereignty to uh, global governance. And this is primarily because of wonderful in improvements in communications technology and transportation technology. Is that going to consider, continue? Are we going to really have an, a different way of structuring the world's uh, political entities in the next uh, 100 or 200 years? And finally, what's it doing to us? Are we going to end up significantly different? The argument is made that the, the, the Renaissance people, the people of the last 500 years, developed because of the printing press. Are we going to be sufficiently changed that in 200 years people will look, look back and say, oh, humanity changed about this time because of the new communication, new computation capabilities?
End of lecture. We can finish here, okay. Well, well we are not finishing yet. Um, actually, uh, if I summarize, we are in, we are in the middle of uh, a digital revolu revolution. Something is happening. It's very hard to know what is happening. And, and, and as a journalist, I'm concerned that, that uh, even when we try to write or report about it, people don't really care that much. So this is a quest question of how, how, uh, how to make sure that how public is educated on data issues, digital, is digital issues, how the policymakers are educated, and even the, even the scientists. Yes. When I was listening to George, I was thinking exactly on that, because you, you mentioned that, that fake news in the, in the new context of this renaissance, and what we are looking for is not an amount of data, an amount of information. We are overwhelmed with information. We need trust, and to build up trust, you need new literacies. The problem is that I'm absolutely fed up when people talk about digital natives. Oh, you have a six-year-old, he's a digital native. Look at how did he does with the, with the iPhone. Excuse me, when I was born, there was already there the book, and I did exactly with the pages of the, of the book, and it doesn't mean that I could read. So if we want the people uh, be able to interpret this information, this big amount of data, we have to include a new data literacy, new information literacy that is uh, looking to the, uh, the truth, looking to the trustworthiness of the, what they consume. Because if not, we are creating a generation of just um, fake news followers, and they don't have any criteria. When we talk about the fair data, I always say that I miss more R's. Fair, reusable, and reproducible, and something that is crucial for me, which is the reliability. Are our data capable to give this uh, layer of the, west, the web of trust? I remember in the Tim Berners-Lee times in the, in the 90s when, when he was talking about these layers of the web, and at the very, very end of the, of the web, we need the web of trust. Can the data be this layer that they are going to make trustworthiness in the whole communication and information system? This is just a question, because people can answer of that, of that trustworthiness from the blockchain technologies or something like that. But what is the, the, the thing that will construct the trust based on data? That's for you. I was a card-carrying educator for 30 years, so education is something that's near and dear to my heart. Um, let me tell you that teaching mathematics is entirely different from teaching computer science. One is a historical subject in the sense that the mathematics you're teaching is 300 years old, back to Newton, let's say, and computer science, every time we taught a course, I had to revise it because the subject is changing so, so rapidly. So teaching our cultural heritage I claim is much easier than teaching what's going to happen. And um, a rather unflattering uh, way of describing that. Uh, and, and so there are going to be leaders, and, there's, and then society is going to catch up eventually. Uh, one unflattering uh, way a person put it was, if you're not part of the steamroller, you're part of the road. And there are only a few people who are part of the steamroller bringing in the new culture, the new technology, the new thing. and Eventually, the rest of us get up out of the road and uh, and climb on the the uh, steamer. Yep. Um, I will start with education and then come to policy making. Uh, first, with education, um, having worked for 20 years in different roles in the world of education and and and, uni and university teaching, I still believe that education is the most powerful weapon to turn to change the world. Uh, it's most efficient and it's most reliable. It can be also used for the bad, but it's for good. 
uh, for God's sake, mainly used for the good. And we are also seeing the global interest for education hugely growing. We talk about the educational crisis. We could also talk about the educational possibility because so many new growing countries are recognizing education as an important investment for their future. And therefore, uh, really focusing on quite classical things such as curricula that are actually part of education system in any given country is an Im one of the important elements when we are preparing ourselves for the sort of new uh, elements of the society, of the digitalized uh, society that we partly live in and that is partly to become. And that's of course relates to the second part of my answer which relates to policy policy making and political decision making and there I'm more concerned simply because I think we see very little leadership that was already referred by George leadership in this field at the moment um, and my example is from the Finnish uh, parliament is there anyone the current members or previous members of the Finnish parliament in the room if not I can talk quite freely okay so, uh, last, <laughs> last December, December 2018, the Finnish government gave a report on information policy and artificial intelligence to the parliament. In the Finnish system, as in many other systems, government passes not only law, uh, not, uh, proposes not only laws, but also give reports for the parliament to discuss and debate. So this was report on information policy and artificial intelligence. And then it was debated in the various committees of the parliament, and finally in the main plenary session of the parliamentarians somewhere in March or April. I personally participated in the, uh, in the handling in the, in the education committee. And quite frankly, very few of our MPs perhaps even would remember that we passed something called report on information policy and artificial intelligence. And there is very few that somehow would see perhaps the huge significance of it for the future of the society. And it's very understandable because it's not legislation at the moment, it's more analysis as to where we are and what should be legislated in the future. And, and, and therefore I think this is a very Difficult question because on one hand we don't want legislators to become overactive and start sort of regulating something that doesn't need to be regulated. But on the other hand, we would need the sort of up-to-date new regulation perhaps quite fast. And if we don't have informed leaders, it's very difficult to come uh, to come to that. And therefore, what I would hope to see perhaps in Finland in the next four years is a, is, a, is, a, is a lively discussion as to, for instance, which minister or ministers should be in charge of the sort of data leadership in the future. Because now it's scattered, so it's more about personal interest rather than a sort of systema systematic approach. Would you like to add, add something to that? Yeah, I can just add a quick comment. It makes me sad to hear that nobody read the report. I was the one writing it, or one of the persons <laughs> writing it. So, okay. So, so about the regulation. Well, it's very different in in the United States or Europe or Asia. Asia, but are there some kind of uh, well legal bottlenecks or regulations that should be made already? What what would you say to policymakers? Well, Pilvi Natvi, you are one of them, but. Well, I could start from my point of view because uh, I spent the last week in Brussels. Uh, of course, the uh, new, new commission or Van der Leyen has come out with the promises in the first 100 days to come up with an AI regulation, which of course scares a lot of people. And uh, uh, I was there trying to get a hold on where are we at the moment on that, uh, on that subject. and. Kind of, it's interesting to see that does actually the European Commission think that we can regulate AI as one entity, which is basically impossible. Uh, what's made me glad that it seems that the work now is is in a in a point that they actually will look more on the EU high-level group on AI and the work 
there that did an ethics and they have the piloting phase now there where companies can actually try out their, their ethical guidelines and that paper will, will be published in, in the beginning of December and I think it's going to be more based as a green paper on those policy rules. But that's on the policy matter kind of what's for me at least is, is most important now. Back in the good old days when we were developing and then commercializing the internet, I used to wring my hands from time to time about, oh, we need a policy on this, oh, we need a law on that. And wiser people than me said, yes, of course we do, and they will come eventually. Don't ask the politicians to do it too soon, because if you ask them to do it too soon, they won't understand it and they'll get it wrong. So we, we live in a lawless period as we're developing new things, and then finally things settle down and we, the fog lifts and uh, then we need our politicians to worry about policies in, in data. It's going to be ownership, it's going to be privacy, uh, going to be restraining monopoly. You can see all sorts of uh, policies that are going to be important and laws as well, but we don't see them very clearly at the moment. Uh, I, I will give you, give you your turns uh, first, Evan, Pilvi, but... but uh, because my neck doesn't allow actually me to ask the, uh, see the questions or comments, I will, I will let you ask a question or two yeah, after this. But, so be ready to ask your questions, but before that, Eva and no, I was exactly thinking an, an, an anecdote that John Boot, which is an old friend of RDA community, always mentioned that he talked to the parliament, uh, the European parliament, and he said, open science is going to happen, but please don't legislate for something that you don't know yet. So I think it was a fantastic advice that he gave to, to the, the, the politicians. But I think the regulation is always one of the motivators of will. I always said that for academics, we have three motivators of will, which is the money, and regulation, and ranking. But then we have also the seduction. And when the technology or with the data or with something is easy and rewarding, you do it. So the problem is that sometimes the legislation is not, uh, is imposed. But I think we need legislation that comes uh, a seductive way of make things happen. I'm absolutely very happy that uh, the research data are now in Europe included in the public sector information uh, directive because I think it's a way of acknowledging that is public good. So I think we need the, 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 the legal framework, but sometimes we always mention that the technology comes before the legal uh, framework. Luckily, because imagine all the way around that if we are making a legislation of the IAA and we don't know what it is. So, but I think the, the most uh, big um, uh, opinion here is you, that you are a politician, so. Yeah, well, very nice to continue from that comment, right? Um, the, well, I, I think it's always healthy to, for us to consider that how do we think the legal framework succeeded or failed in a situation where we now have the biggest companies in the world, Google, Facebook, etc., with the questions we are also dealing here today. Do we think that the legal system sort of was very successful in seeing what needs to be regulated and what not? With that answer, we may then challenge ourselves to think that how should we approach at the moment artificial intelligence, data protection, and so on, in order somehow to differentiate between three groups of legislation. First one is that what is absolutely required and needed. Second one, what is absolutely not needed and one should really be against. And the third group, that which is totally um, useless. In other words, we may have that legislation, but it will never be applied. So we should be able to differentiate between the three and really aim at the first uh, category. And the question that do we have bottlenecks for sure? We also have, I think, made very good, uh, many good openings in terms of opening data actually through legislative processes, standardizing data through legislative processes, uh, pro protection of data as well. I mean, I see many good developments at the moment as well. Where I th really think is the major um, lack at, is in this leadership that I already described. And it's not only, it's not lack of interest, it's, me it's more that it's a complex issue and it's not seen as the part of the field of political decision making at the moment. So, uh, any comments, questions? 
There's one. Yes, hello. My name is Ingrid Mochmann. I'm uh, chair, co-chair of one of the interest groups here and also an RDA ambassador for sustainable development goals. Thank you all for a very interesting uh, debate. I've been asking myself, listening to you, um, since the issue of the panel is data as a game changer. So I was wondering all the time, what is it of the game we want to change? And in what direction do we want to change it? And what would the role of the data be in this process? And if we have answers to these things, I ask myself whether we would also be able to find answers and solutions to some of the questions you have been discussing. Because I think that is one of the problems as a political scientist myself, that maybe exists at the political level. It's so complex that if you don't know what you want to do with it and the direction, how do you know what is the right thing to act? Thank you. Would you like to comment on this? Uh, there's a microphone there. Well, uh, let me um, uh, rephrase something I said a little while ago, that from our little science corner of the world, I think we're trying to implement open science. And open science means open data, and open data means fair data. And places like uh, the Research Data Alliance are telling us how to develop the components that will allow us to create fair data, which will promote open science, which will give us a new scientific revolution. And I think that will spill out into all areas of society, as I mentioned in my 30-minute lecture, um, that uh, just I mean, the internet was developed, right, to, to see whether we could have a system that had uh, uh, all computers being able to be communicated to from the same terminal as before PCs. And, uh, and the way the internet has developed in the last 50 years, no one could have predicted 50 years ago the degree of importance or the rapidity of importance of that activity. Data is the third phase of this computerization of the world, and it's going to be so important that, uh, that it takes a 200-year perspective looking back to really figure out everything that's going to be done. Uh, while I have the microphone, uh, one quick cautionary comment. In my lecture of the future, I didn't tell you one of the potential dystopias that uh, we are looking at, and that would be the... Uh, connection of artificial intelligence, whatever it may turn out to be, and robotics, which may be unemploying most of us. Many technologists have said that by the mid middle of the century, most developed countries might be facing 50% systemic unemployment. What will you politicians do for us if the welfare rolls are 50% of the, uh, of the, of the population? How would we deal that? Uh, the, uh, the historian Harari, in one of his two wonderful books, Read Sapiens and Homo Deus, if you haven't read them yet, in Homo Deus he, he pointedly says one of the major social problems of the 21st century is going to be what to do with all the useless people. How would you like to be described as a useless person? You pose the question to the politician. <laughs> so I'd like to her to answer. Ah, that's a hard one. Nice. Yeah, and luckily I was also presented as the adjunct professor of history, so I will just say that, well, I think the current analysis we are actually using when we also analyzing it from at the, at the Ministry of Employment and, and Economy is that many uh, uh, future analyses seem to predict that roughly one third of professions as we know them now will disappear. One third will be something we can't imagine at the moment, and one third will, titles will remain, but the content will change. So we will not become useless with, with what we will find ourselves doing something different. So I think we are running out of time. Uh, probably we should have, a, have like one panel discussion 
on each question we talked about, but, but today this was this, and Eva, George, Pilvi, Alexander, thank you very much for joining. Thank you very much.